Welcome everyone to Don't Yuck My Yum, a debate on the value of evil alignment. My name is Jared Kilmer. I'm a licensed psychologist and the director of counseling services at game to grow I've had the opportunity to run therapeutic tabletop RPGs among various populations, uh, including uh, children's advocacy centers, private practice, and uh, the Veteran Administration. game to grow is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded on the idea that games of all kinds have the power to improve people's lives. We also believe that power is increased when we play games with intention, and the capacity can be maximized when games are facilitated by a trained professional. We at game to grow run therapeutic gaming groups to help individuals become more confident, creative, and socially capable. Many of our participants have diagnoses of autism, ADHD, anxiety, depression, PTSD, or something else that may get in the way of them fitting in and making friends. We have, uh, today, we are here to talk about evil. And to kick this thing off, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Hi everybody, my name is Elizabeth Kilmer. I am also a psychologist at game to grow I am the Director of Education and Training. I have run tabletop therapeutic uh, groups with children and adolescents and adults. My age range goes from 8 to 86. Uh, I am Nate Caldwell. I am the uh, consulting DM for the Spoon Conservatory. I run a few games, I play in a few games, and I am actively playing an evil character currently. Hi, I'm Jamie Fleckno, uh, Rosie Online. I am the founder of the organization Role Play Lead. I work with teenagers, uh, preteens and teenagers ages uh, 11 to 17, and I do social skills DMing, social skill groups uh, for the kids. And my name is Adam Davis. I am a founder and executive director of game to grow um, I trained as a drama therapist. My master's is in education. I've worked in a school setting. Most of my work is with uh, teens and adolescents. So I, my, I've done a lot of work with um, late, ch ch uh, late childhood as well. Um, so therefore I have a rule against evil characters. Thank in you everybody. all settings. Evil is something I don't want to encourage in my young players. So I oftentimes with young players, I say, here are my rules. You can't be evil and there's no alcohol. No. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. How do <laughs> like, you find uh, kids define evil as a rule? The, that's part of the problem. Um, <laughs> that's part of the reason why I don't, is they say, can we be evil? And I say, no. Uh, and then I say, what do you mean when you say evil? Um, because oftentimes when they, what they, when they're trying to be evil, what they're really trying to do is test boundaries and see what the game can do for them. Um, that's most of the time when young kids want to say they want they say I want to be evil. What they mean is I want to basically explore the world, being mean to people, uh, and killing random NPCs, and oftentimes burning buildings down, uh, stealing from people. It's really just your classic sort of murder hobo uh, kind of game style, which I'm not opposed to that categorically as far as the game to play. Um, but I find that uh, when people say, I wanna be evil, what that often means is they don't wanna play a game that has a story. They wanna play a game where they're like playing Skyrim and they just run around and go into a town and meet a bunch of people and go, cool, I'm gonna make this town empty now and then kill all the NPCs and loot all the buildings and then travel on to the next town classic like the game doesn't matter none of the npcs exist that's oftentimes when i see people wanting to be evil they want to not play the game as a character they want to play the game like a video game where they want to like just test boundaries and destroy things that totally makes I, sense oh, go ahead jimmy i was gonna say i often find i ask my kids the same question like what do you really mean by evil how do you want your character to behave and more often than not it is boundary testing or um, this desire to steal from, I, I mean, literally the first session that my, well, my last group would play with me was, it was in this small town and this person was like, this innkeeper was literally handing yesterday's bread to a line of people who couldn't afford food. And they're like, I'm going to go steal from this innkeeper. And I was like, really? Like, that's, that's the pace we're setting right now. This person who's handing out food to the folks in town who can't afford it and your goal is to steal from her. Okay, well, let's see how that plays out. And then, you know, I guess maybe I've been lucky or fortunate that the other kids are like, listen, we don't want to associate with somebody who's going to do that. Let's talk it through. Let's talk through why, what your goal is and what you're trying to accomplish. Like, yes, good. Thank you. 
<laughs> let's 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 focus on that planning skill, right? Absolutely. Right. I think um, for for me, a lot of the groups that I've run with adults, I've run a lot of groups with veterans um, that have various diagnoses, including things like uh, depression and PTSD, as well as some adoles adolescents with uh, depression and anxiety. And oftentimes, what we see associated with those diagnoses is can be kind of this really low sense of self of self esteem, these feelings of worthlessness, these feelings that we're unlovable, or uh, we that we're bad, we're bad and we're wrong. And so I find that it can be incredibly powerful in games, if that's what your player is coming in with, if they come in, and they really think that they're a bad person. I should also clarify, I haven't met a client yet that I think is actually a truly bad unredeemable person maybe i'll meet one of those people someday but i don't have a lot of expectation that that will happen um when that happens it can be incredibly powerful to have someone come in and say well my character's evil because i'm worthless or i'm evil or like no one should be around me and so obviously my my player or my character is going to be that way. And I think that when that happens, when you have someone who walks in and they really think that they are a waste of space or they think that they are worthless or they think that they are bad, it can be really, really powerful to say, okay, fine, your player is evil. Mm -hmm. Because typically what then happens is you give them the opportunity to save the kid that's been kidnapped or to go rescue the town or whatever it is. And they, they leap on those opportunities because these are people who inherently want to connect with others. They want to feel like they're worth something. They want to have genuine, real relationships with other people. And then you have the opportunity to challenge that. Like I get to say, huh, that's behavior. It doesn't seem super consistent with your character being evil. Has oh. your Elizabeth, it sounds like your that character is not actually evil, though. No, it that character is like not actually they're evil. They're saying they're evil, and then they're not actually. <laughs> but evil. if I say so... no, you can't play evil characters in your game, then like we get to not have that. And I think that it's right. very like, all all but... when we're talking about therapeutic <laughs> RPGs, we are talking about um, implicit learning, right? It's not me telling you, okay, this is how you're going to be better at social skills. So if I just tell this person, oh well, that's not really evil. In some contexts, right, if all they want to do is murder Hobo, that's that's one thing. But if if I'm going to the person, I'm saying, all right, sure. Yeah, you you tell your person evil, then I can challenge that later when I've when they have then shown me that their behaviors are inconsistent with that self belief. If I tell them beforehand, oh, I don't think you're really evil. I don't think you're 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 really going to you're going to people shouldn't be able to trust you. Right. They haven't. I don't know. I don't know them. Maybe they are really untrustworthy. Maybe they shouldn't be around other people. But having that experience to then do something right or do something pro-social, I can then turn around and say, hey, this behavior that you exhibited right in front of me, I saw all of it, is really inconsistent with your character being evil or your character being bad. Did you do a bad job of playing your character? Has your character grown? What's going on there? So well, what you're doing, though, Sorry, Nate, you go ahead, jump in. Sure. You're, you play um, an evil character. I don't know how your character is I evil. Do. Um, <laughs> see, I don't think evil necessarily do means uh, antisocial or unable to work with people or is a murder hobo. Uh, the, way I, the way I think of evil um, has um, basically an evil character thinks of themselves to the exclusion of others' benefit, whereas a good character thinks of another's benefit to the exclusion of their own. So there could be some nuance there. Like it, the evil character I play works really well with the party because uh, the party is benefiting him, which then um, leads into how he interacts with the rest of the world. I agree. I have, uh, we haven't started yet due to schedules and adulting and awful things, but we're starting a new campaign. Uh, my friends and I, and I also like Nate have picked a character, a character who has, just grown up well in this case she grew up in like a cult and doesn't know that she's evil if that makes sense That's um she does awesome. it, yeah so like well she does sort of now because she's been out of it but in her teen years when she was growing up she just assumed that everyone behaved in this way like everyone's home life was like hers and after she left she realized like oh my people were hired for like hired for money to kill people or steal or do something like that that's not okay and so um I, what i was going to kind of 
uh, follow up on what Elizabeth was saying was this idea of like, can our characters grow? So just cut. And I use this with my kids as well. I've given out an evil alignment. I had one child, no lie, cows were being butchered uh, and killed and like the farmers weren't doing it. And he went to the butcher shop, assuming the butcher was the guilty party, rolled a natural 20, slammed the butcher against the wall and snapped his neck. And I was like, okay, now you're evil. You didn't talk to him. You didn't ask questions. You just assumed. So now your alignment is shifting, much as it can shift back the other way. So once this particular child started behaving in a, in a good way, cared about other people, put other people before him, I allowed his alignment to switch back uh, and move towards good again in this concept of like, there are consequences for murder hoboing or, you know, behaving in this negative way, but that doesn't mean you're not redeemable. So it sounds like you are really tying the alignment to the behavior. It's not like you, the core of you, is now rotten and evil and horrible. It's these behaviors uh, are more consistent with this kind of box. Because I think oftentimes when we're talking about alignment, it's it gets really squishy about, like, are we talking about behaviors? Or are we talking about the core of the person? Like, what's, what's happening there? This is a philosophical conversation about, like, the f fundamental nature of the human spirit. Um, this is what I love yeah. about this conversation so much. So the um, this is one of these things. A lot of, a lot of the participants that certainly in Game to Grow groups, we're wanting to help them build cognitive flexibility and non-dualistic thinking. So good evil is reductive, um, both to how the spectrum of the game works, at how the narrative works, but also how the universe actually works. Uh, someone is not evil. Someone is not good. Someone might exhibit some selfish traits, uh, like Nate's character, and and um, I think there's characters who do that that are totally interesting characters. And I encourage players to make like dynamic characters that have their own concepts because there's nothing more interesting in a game than like my character wouldn't do that. Well, why do they do it anyway? Right? There's like some interesting points where yes, your character is super selfish. Then the building's on fire and someone says help, help, and you run inside. Why? Is it because you want the glory? Because you want to feel good about yourself as a helper? So it's not really altruism, right? It's like, because I want to feel like I was the, the, the savior who ran in there and helped somebody. All of those things are just like, maybe there's a concept here we can explore about like the utility of good for selfishness is still good because it's helping people. Uh, there's an interesting conversation to be had around this, around where we value this and how openly we have this conversation with our players around what is good, what is evil? Is there some pl platonic sun we're all leaving the cave to get closer to? Uh, these are the kinds of conversations we have at my, ta my teenage tables sometimes <laughs> as, yeah. as these uh, con conversations of good and evil turn into um, philosophy. How do your conversations of good and evil tie into like the x-axis of the alignment chart? So from the spectrum of like lawful evil to chaotic evil? I uh, throw the whole thing out the window. <laughs> Um, mostly because I, f I find it reductive. Um, I, I think that, um, I think this is true in general. Like I, I think of uh, sort of a, a character with the same way that I would interact with a, hu a human being, which is like a lot of intersectionality. There is like a, a whole rich fabric of the human experience or the elf experience or the dwarf experience or whatever. And I want that character to sort of uh, represent that. And so there are definitely times where I, in my personal life, will do things that like, I regret that hurt people. Um, I don't think I'm a bad person. And I like feel like if I was to be say that I'm evil, then it kind of takes away that journey of redemption. It, the, the cool thing about the world of D&D, though, there are deities that like come down and talk to you. So there is like a little bit of a, a way to align that in a way that doesn't exist in, in our world, to my experience, at least. Um, where uh, I had a player who was a cleric and they were a cleric to, you know, what we trying to make up our own pantheon, but they were a cleric, and then so, sort of like what you were saying, Jamie, this player saw a guard that was guarding uh, a well they needed to sink, uh, sneak into, and he just totally sniped that guy from a distance. Didn't inquire anything about it, just wanted to get him out of there, so just sniped him. And then he was, his character was lifted from this plane and then into a conversation with his god that was like, hey, <laughs> that guy had, that guy had a family. Um, he was just working at this warehouse he didn't know that there was evil stuff going down in the, in the well he was just standing guard and now he's dead and i'm not gonna let you cast spells anymore because that's not in alignment with your uh the the vows you have uh sworn that's as, as amazing 
Yeah. And so he had to go back. And I set the whole story up as a voyage of redemption after that, where he had to make a personal sacrifice. He had to like jump on the proverbial magical grenade and then didn't die and came back. And the guy was like, there you are. That's that's my boy. And then kicked him back. But that's a journey of redemption. I think also, and maybe this is just my mindset, because I do struggle with really the description in the official like handbook about alignment versus experience but i kind of almost this is terrible i kind of look at almost at, a, at a, like a grand theft auto like you know when you steal a car like you get a little bit like wanted and then you like murder some people and you get more and more wanted so i almost look at it as like this is how everyone is looking at you because of your behavior um you might still align with good you might still want to put other people first or whatever the case is but in this particular instance, you killed this innocent butcher who had nothing to do with this. Uh, and now the city guards are looking at you as evil. Your party doesn't really appreciate your behavior at this point in time. So there's that other conversation, or this, this other conversation of like, no good deed goes unpunished or whatever the case might be. Like, this is how other people are looking at you. And it's important to see how you stand, but it's also important to see where you fit into what other people's viewpoints are. We might not want to care what other people think about us, but you now need access to potions and you can't get into the potion shop because there's a big drawn poster with your face on it and a cross out over it. So what have you done? How does that impact the world? I think that's a really interesting way of, of looking at it. I use the alignment chart kind of as like a, a loose tool uh, it doesn't have any impact on the mechanics of my game. Uh, it will have narrative impact sometimes, which doesn't have any impact on the mechanics. And and I think that it's really powerful to look at, like, what is the my view of self versus how do other people see me, right? Because you might have uh, a player who's playing this cleric of who from the light domain who like only does good deeds but still sees themselves as inherently flawed and broken and so like getting to play with okay well what if this is coming from you where are we getting these messages right something that we t i talk with clients a lot is like we uh, learn a lot of lessons from ourselves from other people from the media and we we often kind of absorb those as truth. And so understanding like, where did you get this message that like you're broken? Where did you get this message that no one likes you? Uh, where is this coming from? How true is it currently? How true was it ever? Can be a really, really powerful thing to play with. Uh, I had some players uh, in a game recently where one of the players uh, had a lot of experience with D&D &D, and so he created his character and he brought it in and this particular character was this pompous lordling and he was so annoying he was so annoying <laughs> and when he first started playing I was like oh no like is he is is he just like is he trying to push boundaries this is an adult I was like is he trying to push boundaries is he just trying to like is he not ready to engage in therapy and so this is like his way of engaging um and to be totally honest, I don't actually know what started the creation of this character. But what happened was the way the party reacted. So this was not a character where he explicitly said, I'm evil. But I would have described him as incredibly selfish. Um, and he cared a lot about his family and his family, the way people viewed him. But he didn't really care. The character didn't care that much about how he actually was with other people. It was that appearance was the most important. And the way that the rest of the party reacted, they could have turned around and been like, you're a jerk. We don't like you. You keep calling us peasants. This sucks. Um, but instead, they were like, oh, you know what? This is a game. Like, we can lean into this. That sounds kind of fun. So they started, like, they were like, yes, Lord. Yes. Like, they started asking him. They're like, okay, well, we can't make any decisions until you tell us what to do. Like, we can't, we can't act of our own accord. And so the way that the, the party responded to this kind of obnoxious, really selfish character was um, to kind of pull him in and set him up on this pedestal. And then he realized he was up on this pedestal and he looked around and he was like, I don't like this. I feel wildly uncomfortable with this pedestal. I, I'm starting to care about these people and I don't know how to interact with that. Uh, and it created this incredible vector for dialogue that we got to have around like, why was this character doing this? Why was he pushing everybody away? Why was he treating everybody like crap? Why was he, we had an amazing conversation about microaggressions um, that wouldn't have been possible 
it would have been possible to some extent if I had played an NPC that was similar, but because he was actually a party member and he was another player around the table, um, he was able to speak for what his character was thinking and feeling, I think in a way that would have been way more powerful than if I had done it myself. Um, and so I think having those experiences, especially if you have a character who is willing to have that redemption arc, can be incredibly powerful. Whereas if I had just said, like, I don't want you to play that character, we wouldn't we wouldn't have gotten that. Sure. Uh, circling back to what you said way earlier at the beginning of this, is that the, <laughs> there isn't necessarily a mechanical implication to where they fall on the alignment chart. And that's something I really enjoy about 5th edition. Uh, previously, uh, if your alignment shifts, you lose your paladin privileges, et cetera. Uh, but that could also kind of reinforce some behaviors I wasn't super fond of. So I had was running a one-shot for a character who was, of course, a rogue. It's always the rogues. Uh, <laughs> uh, who decided he was a chaotic, evil character, and he wanted to lean really hard into that. Um, and as a result, the, the party is going through town, finding the guffin, whatever it was. Uh, and he's like, this guy has him. The party's cool. We're going to go talk to him tomorrow morning. We're going to try and uh, persuade him to give us the next step. Uh, so he's like, cool, that's fine. Uh, later that night, he wakes up and rolls like a 25 for stealth because rogue things. Uh, and he's like, I want to sneak into the guy's house. I'm like, cool, he's just going to try and steal the thing. This will be fine. Uh, he's like, cool, I'm going to sneak upstairs. Cool, fine. Uh, I'm going to sneak into their child's bedroom. Oh no. I'm going to murder the children in the sleep. Aha. And then I'm going to bar the parents' bedroom. Great. And then I'm going to set the house on fire. Cool. No. Yes. This, Why? The, the, no. Because I'm chaotic evil. So it's like leaning too hard into that just because of the mechanical benefit uh, is something I'm really glad has been stripped out of fifth edition because people will, especially the, the kind of people who are like, I'm going to turn every screw and min max my character, which fair, I'm guilty of sometimes, especially when I was younger. Um, <laughs> removing that incentive, I think, is really nice about fifth edition. I think that also brings up a really good point around like ki consent and being on the same page as everyone. Like, I don't want to be in that campaign. Like, oh, absolutely not. That. If that's <laughs> happening, like, I don't want to be at that table. Um, yeah. And uh, which is not to say there's necess there may never be a place for that, but like, I think with depending on the context that you're in, there are going to be certain behaviors that are allowed and not allowed, and there are going to be certain themes that are allowed, right? Like. With my group of veterans between the ages of 40 and 75, we're going to be exploring different themes than with my group of girls between the ages of 9 and 15. Like, those groups are going to look really different. And even in my own personal campaigns, right? Like, if I'm playing a game for fun, I don't want to explore the things that I'm anxious and stressed about. I don't, because I'm playing a game for fun. I want to be loud and a little annoying and use a lot of lightning. Um, and so I don't, I don't, I want to play with a group of adventurers. They're doing fun I, things. Adam, I'm seeing I, your face. No, I think, I think what this is getting at that I'm sort of curious about is like the underlying motivation. I'm sort of taking a psychological lens on this, but the underlying motivation for doing that. It's not about the sneaking in the house and killing people and barring the, the, the walls or whatever. It's, it's about power. It's about like control. There's like underlying motivations there. And that's the kind of thing that if, that is the drive then there's probably other ways to make that incentivized in the story like you were saying nate like fifth edition takes out a lot of the incentivization of that kind of like evil behavior like in the fable games like you have to like eat a few like baby chicks to become just evil enough to get in the right doorways or whatever it's like incentivizes that and makes it interesting um fifth edition takes a lot of that away and makes it more narrative so it doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily incentivize that in the same way but thinking about it in the in the context of being a game master and seeing someone want to do those kinds of like overtly horrifying things is probably about having a little bit of power and control over the, the like temperature in the room a little bit like i'm gonna kill the children and then look around and see how everybody responds right a little bit of like uh having a little bit of control of the narrative and the feelings that people have or even like knowing that your choices make an impact on the world a little bit of boundary testing there too i had a player who was um a necromancer so look at me having an evil character. 
um, uh, I was the game master, and um, I let them have their necromancer character. So I guess I was sort of letting them say they were evil, even though I didn't really think they were actually evil, Elizabeth, to be perfectly honest. Um, but this player, to, to, to realize what they were actually wanting out of being a necromancer was control, right? This, this player wanted to, uh, had a lot of trouble making friends in the real world. So how convenient as a necromancer, you can summon friends. And then when they become annoying, you can dismiss them. It is entirely about uh, control. You don't have to make a friend. You can make a friend, right? Um, and uh, um, that the character had a like an undead dire bear or something like that named Mr. Waffles that he just loved having around. And my goal as the game master was to get it to forget about, you know, where is Mr. Waffles? I forgot where he is was my goal because I wanted him to be more focused on the actual human beings in the, in the game. And, and the only way to do that is to, like, not make necromancy like evil bad right i was it wasn't so simple it was understanding what the purpose is and i think that's um i'm kind of rambling a little bit because i think it's interesting about, about like looking at when someone is is trying to do evil evil stuff in the game right um understanding is it because of a like a self-image issue or is it because of like the, the consequences that they're hoping to gain from that i mean you play an evil, evil character and uh, so do you jamie so like are you what, what does it look like? Or you're not the player, Nate, who's going to burn buildings down and trapping people inside, right? Uh, no, that is not me. Uh, so, just, yeah, as a rule, <laughs> maybe a little child murder, not too much. Um, no, uh, the character I play is evil in the sense that um, he doesn't care about the party as much as he cares about him. So there have been times where the party's like, hey, we're in trouble. And he's like, yeah, but you're too close to the trouble. Uh, <laughs> He's a divination wizard, and being able to play with kind of the traditionally like seer divination stuff and kind of twist that into uh, I can see what may happen and I don't like it or it's not comfortable for me, so I'm going to go the other direction to actively avoid things that are even vaguely dangerous or harmful or even just uncomfortable for me. Um, so, yes, he's an evil character, but he works with the party fairly well in the sense that there's more benefit to him being with the party to being out in the world. Sorry. I had two... Oh, go ahead. Do you want to... Oh, I, I, I'd like you to go first, Jamie. I'm trying very hard to stay in the background. <laughs> okay, let me two things. Um, back to way earlier when we were talking about, like, people being at our table and... and doing some having some behaviors that cause us to take a pause one of the things i do and again this is partially because of the age group i work with is we do community guidelines so on the first day of class in the group we all agree to a handful of rules like uh everything that happens in character is in character we don't take that into the person aspect of it if we do then we feel we need to talk about it Things like we don't curse at each other, we don't say anything to each other, even in character that we wouldn't want said to ourselves as well. So kind of like this layout of like, we're here for fun, no electronics at the table back in the day when we didn't have to do it on the computer, um, like that kind of stuff. Um, and that helps a little bit because as the leader, the GM of the game, I can refer back to that if we get to a moment where I can see that something might come up that... Um, will affect the group and I say, you know, hey, these are our guidelines we agreed to back in the day, remember? Um, so that's kind of one way I help mitigate sometimes. The other thing that I do often is, and I say this to all my groups when we start, your character can have whatever backstory that guides them, but remember you're playing a group game. So if you're reluctant to join the party on the first day, that's okay, be reluctant. You've picked the personality trait that I don't trust people quickly. Great, I understand that. But I need you to, again, find some sort of internal motivation, whatever it is. Hey, you don't wanna travel alone on this dark road and you can just hitch on this bandwagon for the you know, five mile journey that it is or whatever. And that often goes even with the evil. If you wanna pick evil, okay, but let's talk about what it's like to steal from your traveling companions. Is that going to make the game enjoyable for anyone? So those kinds of conversations of like, I'm fine if you want to think about yourself first. That's great. That's an, a thing that happens to us, right? We often get selfish in moments. I can relate to that. But if you're going to grab all of your party's coin purses and then try to run off, what are you accomplishing? 
So that kind of covers. I, uh, I am mindful that I am trying to be the moderator and not a panelist, so I don't want to speak too much, but I am compelled to just comment on a few things that I've heard uh, throughout, and I, I don't even know where to start anymore, so I'm just going to like jump around. But uh, I have noticed the conversation move from evilness as a, a characteristic trait to evil as a, a set of behaviors that can be you know, good or bad. Uh, and then watching that kind of shift into, uh, Adam, I think you spoke to this, what is the function of a behavior? Uh, it is a behavior that harms other people um, meeting a certain need for a player? And can we uh, find a way to replace that behavior that we would argue might be evil in something that is actually more of a adaptive pro-social behavior that meets the same function? I'm also hearing a lot that uh, an evil behavior may shift tonally in the context in which it is uh, enacted. Um, and then, Jamie, you also spoke to how uh, other people perceive evil behaviors and how we've got like social capital built up in our groups based on how we are behaving, and we're going to be perceived based off of more or less the aggregate of the behaviors that we are engaging in and not necessarily a single behavior. One of my favorite things to do in games is make the good guys turn out to be the bad guys. Um, you know, of course, there's no such thing as good and bad, just like no good and evil. Uh, but there's some nuances here. Um, but I was pulling a, a, a storyline sort of inspired by the um, Unbreakable movie with, uh, you know, Mr. Glass and whatever. Mm. Um, the Justice Society of Magica, which was, you know, a play on the Justice League. Um, they, the rumor that we were playing with our, our, our sort of um, storyline was that the Justice Society of Magica is holding tryouts where you can join the Justice Society of Magica. How cool is that? So players all wanted to go join the Justice Society. And it turns out to join the Justice Society, you go into this arena and have to fight a werewolf. Um, but they're given fake weapons that break when they try to attack the werewolves. Werewolves scratch them, and then the werewolves are put down by the Justice Society, and then they get taken, injured, and chained to a wall, and then they get watched to see if they become werewolves. What? The point being here that uh, the Justice Society, or just, yeah, Justice Society is trying to figure out who's immune to lycanthropy, and then uh, figure out how to use that and weaponize that to destroy all the lycanthropy. Um, so my heroes, my team of adventurers are like, what, the Justice Society is like doing some like really shady, problematic utility of its fan base um, to turn them into, you know, maybe werewolves. Um, but then the players naturally escaped from this because, you know, that's how the story works. And then they escaped, but they were now werewolves. Um, and so they are now the ones being hunted by the Justice Society who are the good guys, who they know are bad guys. But really, they're werewolves, and werewolves are like categorically bad in the way that the world sees them. So they needed they like ended up going on this whole like reclaiming lycanthropy thing, where they wanted to like figure out the source of lycanthropy, connect with the wolf spirit, and get the the like wolf spirit to forgive them for the ancient like original sin that prompted lycanthropy to begin with, and then went on a crusade to like let the world know that we're here and we're lycanthropes. And like you should accept us for who we are um and that was a whole flip of the script and then they had to go defeat the justice society and be like the outlaws who are the the werewolves and that whole storyline there is like what you think is true is not always true and sometimes you have to realize that there's nuances to the good guys and nuances to the bad guys and maybe not every werewolf needs to be you know assumed as evil and put down because they could be someone who's really just trying to make their make their way in the world I love that. That's an amazing story. And I will steal that storyline. I'm going to tell you, you right know, now. What was so cool about that storyline is that it became a concept about, uh, it, it like was a totally accidental mindfulness lesson. Um, it was it was like totally, one of the players was like, I know how to control my werewolf self. I'm going to tell myself that I'm not angry and I'm going to take all the anger and I'm going to bottle it up. And then I will not be, I will not be, I will not turn into a werewolf because I'll take all my anger and I'll bottle it up. And then Ooh. I won't have to worry about it at all. And then I was like the elder druid underneath the world tree who was like, it could be that maybe your wolf self has something to tell you. And the player was like, wait, my anger is trying to tell me something. Am I listening to it? But without activating it, I can like understand what my needs are. Uh, yes. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> That's the point Couldn't of everything. Of myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's amazing. That's Mr. Miyagi moments. Yeah, I went to... I, uh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I so I have 
this year I've started a new thing where I'm doing a storytellers campaign and asking the parents to the best of their ability based on situations to commit to like a full year, a full school year of doing this. And then we do like a week long, like 25 hours of camp uh, to finish the campaign, which is sort of what we accidentally did last year, but I'm intentionally doing it this year. And um, I can't give it away too much because I know my kids are going to watch this, but <laughs> um, I do, we have, um, I've kind of set it up where uh, they, they grew up in what's called the royal domain of this continent and they were told stories about the history and the war and all of this stuff with the orcs and how they're evil and they've been pushed to the north and all of this, you know histories told by the winners, right, kind of conversation. Um, and throughout the course of this campaign, they're going to make their way up north and discover who the orcs really are, um, which are my favorite people in the entire campaign. I'm super excited about it. Um, but this whole concept of, like, really working on critical thinking. This group that I'm with, um, their parents and all of us, we have a pretty solid relationship. And so they trust me to push their kids a little bit further than I would in some of my beginner groups or some of my newer kids groups. Um, this group is solid. Um, and so I get to really push this idea of racism, of, of stories we're told, of even though you're talking about the orcs being evil, that's because that's what you're told when you read your history books and let's kind of pursue what it's like when you actually meet them and what stories they tell you. And I spend a lot of time read reading Orcish dictionaries and I uh, went to Alaska a few years ago and learned that um, the indigenous people of Alaska were fighting to get Mount McKinley back to Denali because that is their name for it. So I've changed the entire continent to all like Elvish stuff uh, when it all has like Orcish names and things like that, that the kids get to learn over time. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of push that concept of not just evil in my characters evil or evil in the players but the concept of good and evil or whatever it is we determine it to be within society i yeah. love that i that have amazing. so many opinions on uh specifically like npc and creature alignment as they are presented uh there there's a whole separate discussion to be had on like <laughs> where that comes from and how it relates to basically everything to one degree or another uh, it's really interesting to hear the way you guys push that with kids because none of my groups involve kids. They're all your kind of traditional, like, 18 to, like, 30 have been playing D&D for the past five years or longer. Like, I've been playing games since I was uh, 15 years or so, give or take. Um, so it, it's a very different dynamic as far as how I approach evil with NPCs and with characters as compared to the way uh, you guys would have to uh, like as far as like evil races are concerned like you've got your fiends and fae that are traditionally evil to the point of like being enumerated as such in the books and canonically they've been fighting demons for eons or some such um but playing with that idea of it not necessarily being evil especially with fiends and fae uh, i really like the idea of uh kind of contractual magic so like with the devil or you make a deal in the moonlight with a fairy and like with Faye in particular you've got your like read your fine print or else um and i really like the idea of that not necessarily being evil fine print as much as an unexpected fine print so yes Faye are traditionally evil but maybe they just want you to yes go save the forest but also the fine print of that is oh also you have to go get the kids who are stuck there mm -hmm. whatever else i really love playing with that idea of like is this evil or do we just not understand what's happening and so where it either makes us uncomfortable or it makes us scared or like also where did we learn that that lesson that like if i don't understand it it's probably scary or wrong mm -hmm. And we perceive this as evil, but do they perceive this as evil, or is this just kind of a, a regular occurrence? It's a pragmatic issue. I don't... Do we perceive this as evil because we do not understand the context of what's happening at all? We just came in with our uh, understanding of the way our world works, and then assumed that's how everyone's world works? That is how... the plot. <laughs> do we also, though, like, descend into moral relativism? Like, there, there is there a good... I mean, to take it away from whether evil exists, like, is there a good, a platonic ideal for the good life? Um, what are the values that we claim are part of that? And how do we lift those up? Or do we choose to lift those up? Those are like the, 
the greater questions around like you go to a place and you don't understand how they how they work or how they don't understand how you work but like do do we get to say what is good right <laughs> these are the conversations that that, that this like in, interactive story can let us have to let us have our own values clarification around what is good um i think oftentimes I like sorry go ahead but... No, you let me go last time. It's your turn. Okay. I'll go after you. <laughs> I, I think um, I might pull us off in a different direction, so feel free to pull us back. Like, I think oftentimes what we're thinking about is predictability. So one of the other ways that I really like to play with alignment in my games is um, like setting people up to work with NPCs that might be chaotic or might be lawful, right? And like um, oftentimes my players, especially players that are a little bit more rigid, have a lot harder time trusting, like they are way rather going to work with someone who's lawful evil than they are to work with someone who's chaotic good because the lawful mm -hmm. even person is predictable. They don't trust them very much, but they know exactly how far they can trust them and where. Whereas the chaotic good person, they know there's that general good intent, but who knows how it's going to come out. And that can be really overwhelming or really scary for individuals who feel like they really need to control their environment or control everything around them to stay safe. So I think dealing with like talking about the predictability piece is a, is a cool thing to bring in as well. Yeah. For me, I was kind of gearing towards this idea of critical thinking, which I, I find that a lot of my, uh, a lot of the kids who come through my door struggle with a little bit, this idea of being told mom, dad, teacher, some some person in their life who is of greater influence will tell them what to think or do or believe in a particular situation. And a little bit during my last campaign with, with my particular group that's been with me, we explored that. But my goal for this one, since I'm planning it in advance instead of winging it like I did last time, um, is to really push this idea of you're going to go to the monastery, the library, wherever, and gather information. You're going to meet people who you were told behave this way and they don't behave that way what can you critically think like how can you put the pieces together and to answer or maybe not answer but to play off of adam's question of is there good and what is it i get to let the i get to give these kids all of this information from all sides if they choose to explore them and they get to decide what good is or not and that's kind of, then I'm like, all right, let's have the final battle based on your decisions. That sounds like such a cool campaign. I'm really excited. And like, like the kids, the kids played into it really well. You know, I have a, what did we say? Always rogues. I have a rogue who is with like the, yeah, I don't know, like the underground group of good slash evil doers like they're trying to keep the balance i guess and they picked that particular character and it played really well into the story and this whole concept of if you're raised this way does it make you evil or is this just all you knew and now you leave this particular space and see that other people interact differently mm -hmm. i think that like uh we talk about moral injury sometimes right this idea of like i've really i've been in a position that for whatever reason, I did things that are uh, really not in line with my morals or not in line with my values. And that, how do I deal with that? How do I walk away from that? How do I continue to live my life? How do I kind of pull those things together? Um, and so I think one of the really valuable things about addressing some of those things in D&D &D is you can, you can provide and create as much context as you want, right? We can look at it from so many different angles we can we can have from one event that happens i can speed up the time i can slow it down but i can also tell that story through my character's eyes i can tell that story through my player's eyes i can tell that story through any of the npc's eyes i can tell the story through the world's eyes i can tell the story through the god of this particular area's eyes um and i think kind of building in that that understanding in that context can be so valuable because oftentimes what we're trying to do is we're trying to push from this, um, like it's, it's either one or two kind of thinking and talk about like, what is, what is the squishy area in between? Yeah. Nate, I was curious. I obviously mostly work with younger kids. Um, and then my adult friends who are, as Elizabeth was saying, I don't really want to think about the stress. We just have fun when we get together, but I'm curious kind of 
your experience, how you said you have to approach evil differently or you choose to approach evil differently in working with older folks. Um, what kind of approaches have worked? What kind of approaches have, I don't know, backfired or at least given you a learning opportunity as the GM to kind of reframe that particular space? Um, I think uh, a lot of it comes back to the session zero, right? So well, please, please have a session zero for everything. But uh, a lot of that comes down to setting the expectation for what the world is going to be putting you into versus uh, what the party is going to be getting into. Like, it's not just character building as much as it is uh, world building and what is or isn't okay with both the, the human behind the character and the character themselves. Uh, as for uh, experiences that work better, obviously it always works better uh, if you do that. Um, but the kind of specific example with that, uh, going back to Elizabeth, where is it the character that's evil or it just did evil things? Um, I had a character who really wanted to play a warlock, uh, which I love. Like the idea of warlocks and patrons and the way those interact is super fun, especially for me as the DM, because I get to kind of turn all those screws. Um, and they really wanted to play like a, a good person who had like a fiend patron. So what what is the intersection between that look like? Um, so yeah, generally the, the sessions that work better in terms of uh, throwing evil into it, evil being air quotes, is uh, the way that that human defines evil uh, as an act. Like, I tend to prefer my way of thinking about it, where it's intrinsic selfishness as opposed to uh, external altruism, um, where characters who think, hey, I'm just going to murder a hobo my way around and murder children, uh, less so. Uh, so usually it's having a conversation with that player ahead of time, um, and kind of by extension, reinforcing that behavior in the world. Um, so like one of my campaigns is a horror campaign where uh, there is a lot of air quotes evil around, but uh, kind of subverting some of those expectations. So another warlock uh, that the party ran into uh, has a uh, pet spectator, which is a mini beholder. Um, stereotypically super evil. Uh, the spectator in her case is the guard to the library who mm. where she does a bunch of research and the party like walks around the corner and sees a spectator. They're all ready to jump on it. And the, this NPC who they've loved so far is like, oh, hey, that's mine. And watching the head spinning is entertaining for me. I'm picturing Slimer from Ghostbusters. Yeah. Okay. It's very cool. I want to check in real quick. Uh, like I have this last question I want to pitch before we start getting to a, a wind down part of this panel. But I've heard a lot of benefits to observing and critically thinking about problematic behavior and how that uh, the world reacts to a player when they engage in that kind of action. But have any of y'all run into a situation where uh, problematic or evil behaviors have happen between players this is more of a pvp issue and what do you do around your table to intervene so i at my table um for my therapeutic games at least like i don't do pvp checks or pvp kinds of things unless everybody at the table agrees that it's going to be like interesting and fun and adds to the experience if not a, if if um, the players aren't consenting to it. Like if someone says, I want to stab him in the back or I want to steal that thing from him. Uh, cool. Uh, that's not going to happen unless everybody agrees that this would be an interesting way to move the story forward. And we trust that we're all capable of kind of holding and handling this. Um, and so if we don't think that that would be fun for everyone or we don't think that like that's going to enhance our game, uh, which could be it's going to be challenging, but we think we can do it and get past it, then we're going to talk about other ways in which we can kind of talk about and solve these problems. Because oftentimes uh, we don't, we aren't good at conflict as humans. Like we aren't good at talking about our problems and talking about why we're upset. And so PVP can become a proxy for I'm upset with you, but I don't know how to talk to you about it. Um, so if that's what's happening, I tend to not allow that in my games uh, and we'll talk about kind of why I don't want that to happen and talk about other solutions and I will often challenge my players to be like how do we think we can handle this and they're usually pretty creative uh, I had a, a really difficult group um, last year and uh, I had siblings in the same group a brother and two, two brothers and um, they were 
they were Nade's version of evil. Very, very, very out for themselves. Anytime um, magic items were, or a coin was part of the win, uh, they would fight. Over items they couldn't use, I had one kid who, I had a uh, wizard who wanted a shield. I'm like, you can't use a shield also, you're a gnome, and this is a huge shield. It's like, you literally can't carry it, or halfling, whatever, small race, he couldn't carry it. And I was like, I don't, you just don't want the player who can benefit from the shield to have it. I just, trying to understand, um, and before I learned the lesson on PvP, um, uh, they often would fight each other for different things. So they were given, I am very generous with health potions because no one plays a cleric. I don't know if you guys have that in your groups as well, but literally no clerics. Um, and so I'm generous giving out health potions because I'm tired of resurrecting everyone. Um, and so... Uh, they were fighting over who got the health potion, and one of the kids was like, I'm going to steal it off this one's belt. I was like, okay, go ahead and roll a dexterity check. He rolled like a two. I was like, okay, you drop the one on your that, that you're holding and the one on the belt. You drop them both. Now they're broken. So this moment of the rest of the group kind of being really irritated with this particular decision-making process. Um, so I set up an NPC, uh, an old wise druid. I guess Adam and I think about old wise people as druids. I don't know. Um, but basically having this conversation of, hey, so you're trying to save the world from an evil god being brought back. Is it beneficial for your particular shield to be on your back when your paladin could be using it as protection? Um, is that still benefiting the group, even if it's not just benefiting you? So this idea of magical items or coin or whatever helps the whole group even if you're particularly not the person holding it because it's not the right item for you i always pick out items that are particular for my group i don't just throw a sword out there if nobody can wield a long sword you know what i mean mm -hmm. um so kind of having that conversation and and often my my conversations come through npcs mm -hmm. just this idea of let's sit down and talk about it eh, mm -hmm. it got a little better i'm not saying that that was my award-winning moment that was a rough group it sounds like some of the answers to, to that question kind of boil down to group norms, the the culture around the table. A lot of that would get set up maybe in a session zero or something that gets maintained throughout. Uh, does that seem yeah, fair? Definitely. Yeah, uh, totally. Yeah. Um, especially if it's a group you've been with for a while. Like one of the games I've been, we've been playing for a year and a half, two years, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a druid and an artificer who are both good aligned characters, but the way they interact with the world is very different considering they're basically opposite ends of the spectrum as far as mm -hmm. the way you interact with things. And uh, one of the more recent sessions, my artificer started getting getting into it in PvP with our druid and the DM just kind of sat back and watched it happen because it was an interesting story beat because there'd been tension building between those two for a while and uh, that overflowing in a way that uh, was interesting and timely as far as the story was concerned was really fun and uh, watching the party react to that was really interesting too. Like, <laughs> uh, how, do, how does that split happen? Does uh, the paladin hang out with the artificer? Does the uh, sorcerer hang out with the druid and like kind of forcing that discussion via pvp um was something that worked really nicely for that group but it's also because we've had that trust built after playing for so long together i don't allow my players to engage in oppositional actions towards each other without consent from the other person so uh when they want to steal from somebody or trip somebody or like you know, cause someone else to, to fail at something, I always say, is that okay with you for your player to fail at this? And then they can decide whether they want to roll for it or just decide what the outcome is. Um, but then I have had players want to fight in character and I tell them, how is this fight going to end? You can't, one of you is not going to die at the end of this combat. You need to end this combat narratively, still working together towards the, uh, you know, our, our mission goal. So how does that scene end? And they will tell me, we're going to end our, our, our fight um, realizing that we shouldn't have done that. Um, okay, great. Um, and then they played it out, like back and forth. And I, I, I just told them, when someone gets knocked unconscious, they will be brought back. There's no concern. So do whatever you want to do. And then they role played their character combat. And there was like a tiefling and elf, like subtle racism going on in their combat. There was like, you always do this, you always do that, this kind of thing. And then it, it, it uh, resulted in like 
the uh, the bard character doing thunder wave and slamming the, the the other character into a tree and knocking them unconscious. And then like in character, they were like, oh my gosh, what have I done? What have I done? And they run over there and they do the healing. And it ended up becoming this moment where those two players who were sort of manifesting their sort of personal conflict through their characters had the actual resolution that they then needed, which was the combat is or like, our, our tension is real and our tension is authentic, but really we care about each other. And that was how that, mm -hmm sort of played out. Yeah. Um, I have had other ways that I made mini games sort of like that, where they can play in op opposition to each other. Like you are kidnapped and put into a like battle arena called Battle Realm, and now you have to fight monsters, and then surprise, the next round you have to fight each other. What are you gonna do? Like, how are you gonna fake fight each other? So then you're still rolling and describing my sword swing and so on and so forth. And um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite mini games is when the the heroes were interacting with, uh, or, or there was worry that there was an oni somewhere around, which is uh, you know a shapeshifter. Um, I handed everyone at the table because we were in person at the time. I handed everyone a three by five card that said, "You are not an oni." <laughs> awesome. That's but amazing. But everyone knew that everyone got a three by five card that said something, so they were like, "Who is it?" <laughs> uh, I. What did we do yesterday? to see if the other right. party members would know what they all did and it was great so i uh, i want to acknowledge the time we are at that point where we need to say goodbye but one thing i do want to, to just summarize here is uh it this is one of my favorite topics we could talk about this uh, seemingly for hours um evil is a not a simplistic concept when you really start digging in it is infinitely complicated and it sounds like much the way we uh, interact with that concept at our tables and make it appropriate for the the players that we are serving uh, is acknowledging that complexity. Um, as we say goodbye now, does anybody want? I just think we should go go around, tell everyone where people can find you if they want to reach out and ask more questions. Yeah, so uh, you can find me online. Both of us were at Doctors Kilmer on Twitter mm -hmm. uh, because having multiple accounts is hard. And uh, you can also find me at, at Game to Grow. We have a training program if you're interested in learning how to run therapeutic tabletop RPGs. Uh, we have a our training opportunities are ever expanding, but our um, kind of comprehensive training program is launching October 3rd. So if you've not seen that already, you should go ahead and check that out. Uh, you can also join our mailing list. We offer groups all over the world right now. So check out our website, sign up for our mailing list, whether or not you're interested in participating or running a group. Cool. Uh, you can find me at uh, TechSoup on uh, most places in the internet. Uh, I'm also a player in the ongoing Treasure Tuesday campaign that you can watch on Twitch. That is at like Seven Spoons channel. Um, I am also a co-DM on the Broken Vein campaign, which you can find at the same place. Um, and you can sometimes find me with Game to Grow, where I'll be doing some webinars here and there. Uh, I am at Rosie underscore games on Twitter. Uh, you can find me also at Roleplay Lead, which is my organization, Roll with Two Ls, like rolling a dice. Um, and yeah, I'm also working with Jasper's Game Day, if you guys haven't heard of that. They're an organization that um, raises funds to help with uh, teen suicide prevention and awareness. We do all kinds of events online, and should we ever get together in person again, we'll be at those too. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out. And you can find me, my uh, personal Twitter is at Sparks for Sharks. And you can also make sure to follow at Game to Grow. Um, and like Elizabeth said, um, we are offering groups worldwide now. So um, wherever you are watching this video from, uh, make sure you see, see if we have a group that uh, is a great group for you. Bye, everybody. Bye.